Okay, so today ready? The title of my message is Silence the Noise. Now, last week, I was out with Pastor Estella, and horror of horrors, my iPhone battery started dying on me. Now, I didn't have a charger on me, and we couldn't find a charging station, remember those? At the shopping mall, so I was like, quick, 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 we, either we need to go and find a store and buy a charger, or we need to get into the cinema right now, before my phone dies, and I can no longer prove that I'm vaccinated. Ah, <laughs> <sighs> life in 2022, right? Anyway, we make it into the cinema, and by the time the movie was over, knowing how getting things done and listening to podcasts while traveling are like an appendage for me, Estella goes, oh my god, are you going to survive this train ride home? You know, are you sure we don't need to find a store so that we can get you a new charger? And I reply, I will endure. <laughs> hey, kidding, I'm actually pretty okay. I like some of you here. <laughs> But you know what? On my way home, my first instinct was actually still to take out my iPods Pro and pop it in, even though I couldn't listen to anything productive. I went, you know, I can still enjoy the noise cancelling. But as the AirPods go in, as I'm putting them on, I say to myself suddenly, you know, you know what? Let's go big. Let's learn to be silent without any assistance. And so I pop it back in my bag and I take a deep breath. I, I kid you not, I'm in the train station and I, and I actually start to do box breathing. If you don't know what that is, I will show it to you later, okay? As I wait for the train and I start to say to myself, I will survive, I will survive, I will survive. It's just one and a half hours, one and a half hours, one and a half hours. You won't die, you won't die, you won't. Right, so this whole episode, right, spawned a couple of observations and reflections for myself, okay? First is, I found myself reminding myself that there was a time when cell phones and headphones didn't exist. There was a time, I know some of you don't remember it, but for me, there was a time when I didn't have music or another person's voice to accompany me on the way home. There was a time when I didn't need to silence my surroundings in order to find inner quiet so that I could meet with God. There was a time when I met with God all the time, every day, any moment in my day where there was nothing to do except be present. You know, Richard Rohr has this great line in one of his books that goes, silence is not the absence of being, it is a kind of being itself. We do not hear silence, rather it is that by which we hear. You know, has it ever occurred to you that silence is necessary for prayer. That boredom, everyone say boredom. boredom. That boredom is often the space in which we encounter God's presence. Now, a second observation I had on the ride home was about people. Because when you have nothing to do, that's what you do, right? You talk to God and you watch people. So we were all standing waiting for the train to come. It was Orchard Station. And literally, as I looked down the line along the glass doors, everyone that day, for that moment, had their eyes glued to their phone. Now I know that isn't all the time, right? But that moment, even friends who were together, they were more preoccupied with their phone than with each other. And in that moment, I felt like I was looking in the mirror of who I am sometimes, maybe far too often. Always distracted, never 100% present. You see, again, once upon a time, traveling home was my prayer time. Not my learning time, not my working time, not my distract myself on Instagram time. Most of the time, I either reflected, prayed, or on long rides, I would actually take out my Bible and all my highlighters, and whenever I could get a seat, I'll be juggling them and highlighting my Bible. Now, there are pros, right? Today, our phones allow us to get more done than I ever thought possible. The downside, anybody can reach me at any time of the day, including Facebook. <laughs> you know, once upon a time, TV was only available on certain days at certain timings and only when someone else at home didn't want to use the TV. Netflix and YouTube wasn't there to eat into my quiet time with God. You know, nowadays the only time I can't be preoccupied is when I'm in the shower. 
But man, I tell you, it will be the apocalypse when headphones become fully waterproof. But even then, I got to confess to you, I sometimes bring my phone in with me and attempt to listen to podcasts and even reply messages while I'm showered. Nowadays, I actually have to stop and find ways to be quiet amidst all the noise and the distraction. And it strikes me that it's no wonder why our generation finds it so hard to find God. It's no wonder that sometimes, even in our churches that can be so happening, say Jesus' name 100 times, and yet feel so little connection to His presence. So you know C.S. Lewis? How do you know here C.S. Lewis, right? Now, you probably know him as the writer who created the Narnia series of books, okay, which got made into the Disney blockbuster movie, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Well, he actually was a theologian, and he wrote another famous book called The Screwtape Letters, which a bit of trivia for you, he dedicated to his best friend, J.R. Tolkien, who was the author of The Lord of the Rings. So two of them used to meet and write and talk theology and God. So The Screwtape Letters book is basically the story of a senior demon, named Screwtape, who is writing to his nephew, Wormwood, a junior demon, mentoring him and giving him advice on various methods of tempting human beings and undermining God. So in the story, Screwtape describes the devil's realm as a kingdom of noise. And he tells his nephew, we, referring to demons and hell, will make the whole universe a noise in the end. You see, C.S. Lewis was not just making a random creative comment. His comment on noise actually accurately reflects the sentiments of hundreds of years of philosophy and theology in church history. Now, in fact, many Christian ancestors that we have, theologians and mystics, they actually argue that silence and solitude, which we'll talk about next week, are the two most important of all our spiritual disciplines and practices. Now, what are spiritual practices and disciplines, you might ask? Okay, well, things like reading and meditating on the Bible, things like evangelizing souls, things like taking care of the poor and the marginalized and serving the world. Things like prayer and fasting. So for many, it's interesting, right? Many of our predecessors, to them, silence and solitude were the most important of these practices. It was for them the starting point of being able to follow Jesus well. Because it is when we are silent that we can hear God. It is when we understand the value of solitude that we can experience being caught up in God's presence and person. So, if there's one thing I want to encourage you to do in 2022, is listen, don't underestimate the power of your quiet time. You know, I find nowadays in progressive Christianity, it sometimes feels like doing quiet time is this outdated religious legalistic practice. It's not. It's one of the richest, most powerful habits a human being can have. You know, our secular world calls it mindfulness, minus Jesus, of course, but we call it being together with God. I mean, do we have that? I mean, that's pretty funny, right? I had to put that on there. You know, at first I searched the, 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 the actual painting and then I found this. You know, it never ceases to amaze me how corny Christians are. So this, right, was actually taken outside the office of a Christian Korean Plastic surgeon <laughs> named Dr. Kim in his attempt to evangelize non Christians. I mean, look at that woman's expression. <laughs> She's thinking, Jesus Christ. <laughs> okay, 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 take it down, right? Okay, so a couple of very simple points for you today for the message, all right? The first thing is number one, silence the external noise. You know, the very interesting thing is the word silence in the New Testament is the Greek word phimor, which means to quiet, to put to silence, to say nothing, to muzzle. And what is fascinating about this word is that in the Gospels, the four Gospels, it is used only by Jesus. And predominantly in two ways, okay? The first is when Jesus tells demons to be quiet. 
And the second is when he tells the religious hypocrites to shut up. And that's everything you need to know about silencing the noise in your life. <laughs> you know, at any given time in our human life, something and someone is always speaking. Society, expectations, the movies we watch, the news we read, even the podcasts I love that we learn from. Someone and something is constantly flooding the airways of our existence. Now, I'm sure you already know this, but noise pollution is literally one of the biggest contributors in the world to increase anxiety, exhaustion, and depression, particularly in major cities. So, for example, in Europe, they found that just a 10 decibel increase in aircraft noise for people living near seven major airports was correlated with a 28% increase in anxiety medication use. In the US, people living in areas with more road traffic noise were 25% more likely than those living in quieter areas to have symptoms of depression. You see, what happens is too much noise triggers our brain's fight, flight, and freeze response, our stress response, which in turn causes our bodies to produce adrenaline, and then from there, it's a domino effect of various stuff in our body, right? That creates prolonged high, you know, levels of stress. So what they found is that high noise levels are associated with nausea, headaches, high blood pressure, low sleep quality, even mood changes such as anxiety and argumentativeness. If you're sitting next to someone who's argumentative, you know, ask them right now, is your home too noisy? <laughs> <laughs> now, scientists say the serious zone, okay? The danger zone is when noise levels stay at 80 decibels and above. That's actually literally dangerous for your health. But guess what? Do you know in most busy cities, including Singapore, at peak hours, we average around 60 to 70 decibels even in our housing estates. Now, Singapore does what it can by implementing building technologies and planning and regulations to limit noise, especially when it's time to go to bed. But as you can imagine, it's an unavoidable reality for us. Now, obviously today we're not talking about extra noise, right? But you can see how the metaphor fits. The same stress that is triggered when we encounter actual noise is actually the same stress cycle that is triggered when there is too much metaphorical noise in our lives. You know, for example, too much secular noise. The media telling us what we need to have in order to be successful and well-liked. Too much comparative noise, looking at our friends and envying them in an unhealthy way. Too much legalistic noise sometimes. And by that, I don't just mean religion, I mean both religion and culture. Both of them telling you that certain things are the right way or the cool way of doing life. Now, I'm not saying that some of the noise isn't good or isn't true. There are good frequencies out there. But more often than not, external noise in our lives is a complex animal. Most of it needs to be cancelled. And what's left needs to be tuned and fine-tuned. So I got a couple of questions for you today. And the first is, which voices do you need to cancel out from your life? So that you can start to return to some sort of state of holistic health. So that you can start to maybe reconnect with God. Number two, which frequencies do you need to limit or increase your exposure to? You know, on Friday, I deleted all the social media apps from my iPhone. I actually unsubscribed also from all the email, advertising, and newsletters I didn't want to be pressured by. Now, I don't plan to be off social media forever, but I wanted to start my 2022 coming to a state of less noise in my world so that I can effectively evaluate, think about, project, and plan for my future. Now, I also spent the first week of the year reconnecting with the right people. I spent a whole afternoon and evening with my best friend, talking, sharing, you know, chatting about what we're thinking about, what we're struggling with, what we're evaluating in our lives. 
You know, I turned on and adjusted my notifications for my online community app with Paul Scanlon to make sure I prioritize them and prioritize all my sessions with him in my schedule. I reconnected with one of my professors in the US to find out how he's doing to see if I can get involved with his work and have his voice in my life as a church builder and an intellect. So listen, we've all got to be intentional and start silencing the noise around us, then piping in the sounds and voices that build who we are. Number one, silence the noise. Number two, still your internal noise. You see, silencing external noise is one thing. Actually, it's the easier thing. I know some of you are going, oh my God, delete social media. <laughs> Hardest thing in the world. But it's actually the easiest thing. But bringing your inner world to silence and stillness, now that is seriously challenging. Now, here's a widely quoted verse for you, right? But it's okay with you. I'm going to read three different versions today, okay? Philippians 4, 6 to 7, the Common English Bible says, this is Paul writing to his people, don't be anxious about anything. Rather, bring up all your requests to God in your prayers and petitions along with giving thanks. Then the peace of God that exceeds all understanding will keep your hearts and minds safe in Christ Jesus. Message, Bible version. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers. Letting God know your concerns. And before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. Now, Philippians 4, 6 to 7, this is the complete Jewish Bible for all the leaders and some of the Bible enthusiasts here. Okay, here, don't worry about anything. On the contrary, make your requests known to God by prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Then God, shalom. Passing all understanding will keep your hearts and minds safe in union with the Messiah, Yeshua. Now, I have to admit, right, over the last few years, I've gotten really frustrated, maybe bored and tired with this verse. Because when I was a youth, right, everybody quotes it everywhere. I mean, if you follow any Christian Instagram, it's like, boom, it's up there, right? It was always when I was a youth, yes, amen, don't worry about anything, but now as an adult, every time I read, do not worry about anything, I go, Ch <laughs> easy for you to say. <laughs> but this week, I think Paul might be on to something, okay? You see, do you know how noise-canceling headphones work? I love noise-canceling headphones. I'm quite terrible. I have three. And dang, look at that one. I remind myself, breathe, simplicity, simplify your life. Okay, so here's how noise cancelling headphones work, okay, in an oversimplified nutshell. It uses a nifty little trick called phase inversion. So basically, the headphones have these tiny microphones that listen to ambient noise around you, monitor it, and then capture it. And then the captured noise, which has a certain wave, right? passes through the onboard technology inside, which then recreates a sound that is exactly the opposite of that wave in order to cancel the other wave out. So basically, you know how it works? You know like how minus one plus one equals zero? Sort of the same thing. It's a way of creating anti or contrary noise. Now it sounds easy, yeah? but it's actually really a really challenging result to achieve. So what does Paul tell us to do here in order to cancel out the noise of our anxiety? He tells us, take that noise, capture it, pass it through prayer, praise, and thanksgiving, and pass it through the ultimate noise canceller, God, who creates contrary noise. Then you experience God shalom the peace and wholeness that passes all understanding. It will fill your heart and mind. It will keep you in union with Jesus and with his design for you. 
You see, I think far too often, right, why we don't have peace in our lives is we just allow our internal noise to play on a loop. Louder and louder and louder, and as it does, worry and anxiety builds and builds and builds. We try to shout positive thinking at it. We try to declare desperate prayers at it. But all that does is add to the noise, not cancel it. Paul says, no, if you want to cancel the noise, you need to take it, contradict it to itself by letting God sample that noise, you know, by voicing your fears, your anxieties, your hopes and your longings to Him. But with the right attitude and perspective of trust and gratitude, all that switched on. With acceptance and surrender to God so that He can take that noise, flip the wave and play it against itself so that you can experience peace. So one of the things that I'm honestly evaluating in my life at this moment is what's the quality of how I come to God with my worries and anxieties? So questions for you today. Are you healthy in the way you give your worries to God? You know, am I really presenting my requests to Him? Do I even come to Him with them? Or am I actually just playing them on loop? in my head. You know, I'm also asking myself, is the way I come to my friends with my struggles and share it with them healthy? You know, are we, our relationship, you know, helping to listen and cancel out each other's noise or are we actually adding to each other's noise? Right? You see, another definition of the word fimor actually is not just too quiet, to put the silence, to say nothing, to muzzle. It also means to still. So besides being used by Jesus to silence demon and religious leaders, the only other time it occurs in the Gospels is when Jesus stills the storm. You know that story? So the story goes, Jesus and his disciples are in their boat and they're crossing a lake called the Sea of Galilee when a raging storm kicks up. It is so bad, the waves are so high and they are crashing against the boat that the disciples, many of them who are fishermen by trade, they are hysterical. Beside themselves with fear, believing everybody is about to die. But meanwhile, meanwhile, while this commotion is happening, Jesus is sleeping soundly at the back on the boat. And the Bible is very interesting, it adds, on a pillow. Okay, again, another sorry rich with metaphor, right? You have on one hand the disciples who are in a frenzied, overwhelmed state of mind. Then you have, in, you have Jesus in such a state of internal calm that he's asleep. Mark 435 says they woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care that we're drowning? Jesus got up, gave orders to the wind, he said to the lake, Silence! Be still. The wind settled down and there was a great calm. Then Jesus asked them, why are you frightened? Don't you have faith yet? So listen, besides petitioning God desperately, God will sometimes ask us to take a book out of Jesus' example. And that is to learn how to have faith and to speak to our storms. To tell it to be silent. To tell it to be still. So yes, on one hand, we want to come to God authentically, come to God with however we are feeling. But remember, always aim to keep on growing and to do it with a proper attitude and perspective. To understand that, hey, you know what? We love a God that will still save us when we are hysterical. But He will much rather we learn to develop some internal trust. A stillness that knows God is God and everything is going to be okay. A stillness that also understands that life is life, but that God still works all things, even the bad, for our good. We want to come to God with faith and trust. But up a level, we want to aim to get to a place where we grow our confidence and faith. So it's great that disciples ran to Jesus when they were desperate. It's great that we all learn to lean on God when we are struggling. But in this particular moment, not every moment, but this one, I think Jesus would have been proud if they had dared to speak to the storm on their own. 
because it would have demonstrated growth. So the third question to ask yourself is this. Number one, are you healthy in the way you give your worries to God? Number two, are you healthy in the way you share your struggles with your friends? And number three, am I being intentional about growing a stronger mind? Amen? We want to grow a stronger mind that is unfaced and that is to speak to our storms in life. Next, number three, this is an interesting one. Stop adding to the noise. <laughs> so this year for Bible reading, we're headed back to the Old Testament, right? And one of the stories that is endlessly fascinating to me is the story of Adam and Eve. The story of their relationship with God and their encounter with the serpent. But the one bit of this story that I've been chewing on lately is the bit just after their sin and their fall, and it's the moment where Adam and Eve are hiding from God. So it says there, Genesis 3, verse 8 to 11, During that day's cool evening breeze, they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the Lord God in the middle of the garden's trees. The Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? The man replied, I heard your sound in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Then God said again, who told you that you were naked? Who told you that you were naked? I don't know about you, but to me, right, that is a baffling response from God. I mean, they had just sinned and God didn't ask them, who did it? Who was it that tempted you to eat what I told you not to eat? You know, how come God didn't go, why? Why did you do it? Why did you disobey and squander your inheritance? Instead, God asked Adam, where are you? And who told you you were naked? Now listen, I don't have a fully crystallized point that I want to make yet, okay? by random reflection. And that is, all of us here innately, we're all born with the power to influence another person's mental and spiritual state. You know, Adam was naked, and I'm sure both him and Eve, you know, they were self-cognizant, I won't say self-aware, but cognizant that they were naked. <laughs> Not rocket science, right? They knew to a limited extent that they had sinned against God. They could articulate to a limited extent that they were naked. Except maybe I would say their language for it was limited. Because they could say they were naked, they were afraid, but they couldn't articulate that they were feeling guilt and shame. They went to run and hide, but they didn't realize that what they needed to do wasn't to hide, but to repent, to apologize and to change. They assumed that God was going to be angry and vindictive, but God asked them instead, where are you? And who told you that you were naked? Now, I'm sure one day I want to delve deeper into this, but for now, this is what I want to share with you, okay? You know, I don't want to be the person who is the serpent who tells Adam and Eve they are not smart enough or wise enough to keep up with God. I don't want to be the voice or frequency that makes someone feel that they are naked. Now, let me be clear, Adam had his own issues going on, right? I mean, because when human beings, when we are insecure, it doesn't matter. Sometimes even if the people around us are not pressuring us, we read it in an insecure way, right? God wasn't doing anything judgmental, but Adam responded with insecurity. So we need to be aware that there's some work that we got to do in this process to work on ourselves when we are struggling with noise, right? But as far as my relationship with other people goes, I don't ever want to be the person that intentionally or unintentionally adds to someone's already broken and anxious state. There was a serpent who did that. He did it intentionally. There was Adam and Eve who both were so insecure, they unintentionally added to each other's fears about God. Right? 
So here's a bit more to jar, jar your thoughtfulness, okay? We spend so much time hating that we feel anxious about what our friends post on social media. Some of us wish, not all the time, but sometimes that they wouldn't post certain things. I mean, yes, we feel happy for them and that's great, but other times it's also not so great. Am I cutting too deep here? Am I making us feel a little too naked? <laughs> Again, I'm not saying always, right? I'm saying sometimes. <laughs> We scroll social media and it makes us feel anxious. It makes us feel envious in a not healthy way. It throws us off our focus. It throws us off the game of who we are. And yet, I've noticed we never stop to be real that we are often part of the problem. Because we also post things that make other people feel anxious. Too much truth. <laughs> Look again, right, I'm not advocating eradicating social media from our lives. We don't want a weird church with weird Christians. Although maybe I am a little bit advocating it. <laughs> I'm not asking us to become hyper sensi Hyper-overthinking as a generation. Because, like I said earlier, interaction is complicated, whether in person or on social media, right? Sometimes we can't 100% control what we say or do. It's not intentional. And... Often, we can never 100% control somebody else's reaction to us. So, and listen, I want to say this. I love posting, for example, about you guys. Because I want you to know that I am proud of you. But sometimes, it's still important to ask, number one, how does posting or not posting make me and others feel? Two, sometimes it's good to ask yourself, is there a better way to connect with my friends? You know, sometimes walking up to somebody, giving them a hug and looking them in the eye and say, I am so proud of you, is better than showing off something on social media. Not all the time, but sometimes, right? You know, number three, am I sharing my life in healthy ways? You see, are you sharing this to share your life or to boast about your life? Am I doing this because I have a healthy pride in what I do and I think that is important to be proud of yourself? Or am I doing this because I'm actually hiding that I'm ashamed of my life? So what I'm asking us to do is to just adjust a little bit. Something which I've tried, tried to do as much as possible in the last couple of years. To be more thoughtful about how I use social media. Not just what I'm taking in, but also what I'm putting out. Because just because everyone does it doesn't mean it's good. Just because something makes us look cool doesn't mean it's great for us or for our communities. So listen, please don't stop posting because I love seeing what's happening in your lives. You know, I actually have a, I have a private Instagram where I, I follow all of you so that I don't have to look at all the other stuff in the stream and I can just look at you. Is that a little too stalkery? <laughs> okay. But it's one of the ways that I, I just figuring out little ways to be proactive about not adding to the noise and controlling the noise in my life. You know, be, you know, and I think it's a great way sometimes if you curate what you post, it's a proactive way to create your own anti-noise for yourself and for other people. Okay? But finally, which is the whole reason why we're saying all this, right? We want to silence the noise so that, number four, we can tune into God. And for those who are not Christians here, for you to tune into yourself. So, do you know that besides having a voice... God has a sound. That even when human beings are running and hiding from God, even when psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually they were far from God, before Adam and Eve heard God speak, they could already sense His presence. Right? Genesis 8 to 11 says, During that day's cool evening breeze, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. Then God called to the man and said, where are you? 
We're never as disconnected from God as we think we are. Even in moments where we've made a mess of things, even in moments where we feel we are so naked, so broken, so vulnerable, so disconnected that there's no returning, human beings still somehow deep inside are tuned to sense the presence and sound of God. Because everything in life has a frequency, did you know that? The universe that we live in has a certain frequency. Everything, tree, animal, inanimate, animate object, all of us, we carry, we resonate, we vibrate at a certain frequency. And the unique thing about God and human beings is, metaphorically in the Bible, we are specifically tuned to one another. Because when God created, He created every being, so there's something in every created thing in the universe that vibrates with God. Everything. You don't have to call yourself a Christian. You don't have to confess the name of Jesus. Everything vibrates at the frequency of God. But the unique thing about God and human beings is we're specifically tuned to one another. Because when God created us, the Bible says He put and breathed His own spirit, His very essence, His very sound, His very vibration into us. And so no matter how far we fall, how far we run or hide, somehow we are never that far. And I think that's why in all his teachings in the Gospels, Jesus never ever said, no matter who he was speaking to, even the worst of us, he never said that God's kingdom was far. That we have to clamor and fight and claw our way back to him. He always said, either God's kingdom is here, or God's kingdom is near. We just need to become quiet enough to hear it. It's an incredibly profound thing, I think. St. John Climacus, a Syrian monk and a church father, said this, the friend of silence draws near to God. You see, the truth is none of us here, none of you really at the beginning of this year needs, to teach, needs me to teach you how to hear from God. Every one of us, even without attending a class, actually instinctually knows how to sense God. We just lack sometimes the practice of silence that gets us there, especially today. And you see, that is what quiet time is, right? So all the non-Christians here, quiet time is this practice that we call it quiet time in contemporary church, which is like we'll spend maybe 30 minutes, one hour praying, reading the Bible, talking to God, reflecting. But this is really essentially what quiet time is. It is silencing the external noise, stilling the internal noise, choosing not to be a part of the noise, and choosing instead to make space to be quiet and to tune into God. Now I know there are many of us here, like I said, you are new, not Christian. Maybe you're interested, maybe you felt something the past couple of weeks, but you're not there yet because you haven't heard God speak directly to you. But listen, I want you to know, as you start 2022, we are all designed to know God. Even if it just starts with a little bit of His sound. You know, we might call Him higher power, bigger picture, goodness, good energy out there in the universe. And if that's where you're at, cool. But I do want to encourage you. Don't just let that feeling be another sound like the rest of the noise around you. Choose to lean into that sound. Choose to lean into the frequency of goodness, of something bigger than yourself, of someone higher than all the noise that's bombarding your life. Tune in to God.